In the year 610 AD on a rocky mountain overlooking Mecca, a 40-year-old man named Muhammad was reflecting on the purpose of life. After years of deep thinking and meditation, he began to receive divine revelation. The revelations that he received is called the Quran, a divine book which came from the same source as the Torah sent to Moses and the gospel which was given to Jesus Christ. The relationship between the Qur'an and the previous revelations is that of a clarifier and explainer. The Qur'an comes from the same source as is illustrated in the Qur'an and even in those previous revelations that prophesied the coming of Muhammad and the Qur'an itself. To this day, the Qur'an continues to be the key source of guidance for billions of followers. People from all walks of life adopt the way of the Qur'an through the example of Muhammad. Because of the profound and holistic nature of the Quranic text, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had the task of explaining it to his followers and his companions. And these explanations of Prophet Muhammad are compiled in what's known as the Sunnah. The relationship between the Quran and Sunnah is a relationship of paint to a brush. The Quran brings universal general colors which are painted in the lives and hearts of people by the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So the Quran orders us to pray, it orders us to fast, it orders us to pray charity, and the Quran even mentions fighting in the cause of God. All of those are depicted and illustrated by the Sunnah which paints those general universals into the lives of people. The Sunnah provides guidelines needed by humanity for any issues that one may face. From fine aspects of life like basic daily activities, such as matters of health and hygiene, to the forming and running of a government. What became the most controversial of all these teachings is a concept known as Jihad. In today's world, people from a wide range of cultures have different understandings about the term Jihad. The word Jihad comes from the Arabic root Jahada, which means doing extra effort. So linguistically, the word Jihad, we can say that it means striving and struggling. The word jihad in the Muslim world actually carries with it a very positive connotation. I have a number of friends uh, in Egypt as well as other countries. Their names are jihad. I even know some small beautiful girls with apple, apple rosy, apple cheeks. Their names are jihad. And even when you go to take an exam, for example here, and you're struggling, they'll tell you make jihad. So the word jihad actually for the, the majority of Muslims carries with it the sense of struggle and strife against oneself in order to improve their lot and, and draw nearer to God. Islamically, it has three meanings or levels. The first one is spiritual jihad, inner struggle against evil inclinations and the pursuit of self-purification and life of virtue. 
you struggle against your own ego, against your inclinations, your evil inclinations, and your desires to live a better life and to attain sincerity. It encompasses every aspect of the person's life, from being good to one's wife or husband, being good to one's children, kind to one's neighbor, speaking the truth in front of the oppressor, waking up and praying in the middle of the night. All of this is encompassed under that internal drive, that hard drive that pushes the Muslim, which is called spiritual jihad. One of the aspects of Islam is charity. When Muslims give charity, they're supposed to keep this between them and their creator and not to tell anybody. This is to stop them from showing off. It's very difficult not to tell anybody. For this, you need jihad. Prophet Muhammad promised paradise for the person who spends in charity with the right hand while the left hand is unaware of it, which is a metaphor for spending in charity secretly with sincerity in order to protect the integrity of one's intention. The poor people of Medina were receiving supplies to their doors at the darkness of the night, and they did not discover who was bringing them until he passed away. And that was Imam Ali Zin al Abidin, the great grandson of Prophet Muhammad. Until this day, many Muslims are following the footsteps of those great early Muslims. So profound is that experience that we find countless examples of American Muslims and Western Muslims and Muslims the world over engaged in sacrifice, such selfless sacrifice to help others. In America during the Katrina hurricane, I remember when I went to Houston, Texas, before the government had agreed to subsidize people, a Muslim man had donated his hotel, free rooms for victims of the hurricane uh, Katrina. That all falls under that massive mechanism known as jihad nafs or spiritual jihad. The second meaning of jihad is verbal jihad, which is saying the truth, even if it's against one's interests. In some countries, when people say the truth, they can end up in jail. In many countries around the world, saying the truth is a big risk to one's freedom or even one's life. Standing for justice and saying the truth is considered verbal jihad. What is the position of Islam on this point? Does Islam tell you to keep quiet, to be safe? No. Islam tells you to stand up for the truth, enjoin what's good and forbid what is evil, even if you are risking your life. Because we all have to die, and it is better to die with dignity so that future generations will benefit. Civil rights activists who speak against tyranny and oppression are actually performing verbal jihad, uh, which actually has a big impact on the reform of any society. And this is encouraged by Prophet Muhammad in many statements. He said, the best form of jihad is the word of truth in the presence of a tyrant. Throughout history, the greatest instrument of change has not been weapons, nuclear bombs, guns, murder, harming people. The greatest weapon of change has been the tongue. Throughout history, how many societies, how many people's lives have been impacted by someone who had the courage and, and, and the willpower to rise up and speak the truth? For that reason, Islam considers speaking the truth as one of the greatest forms of struggle. And it is in that light, if we look at our own history, that we've seen without the tongue, there would have been no change. Where would the civil rights movement be if Martin Luther King had never stood up and said, let freedom ring, let freedom ring? In that same, same pulse, the Muslims are encouraged to stand up and say, let freedom ring, let the truth ring, and speak to power and oppression. However, when the word jihad is mentioned in non-Muslim societies, it is not the spiritual nor the verbal type that comes to people's minds. It is the third meaning that causes great concern. This is combative jihad. Combative jihad is definitely the type of jihad which has caused the concept itself of jihad to be by far the most misunderstood Islamic concept. That's why we have to focus a lot on this type of jihad the combative jihad, and explain the reality of it to both Muslims and non-Muslims. Combative jihad has to be the most misunderstood subject within the Muslim world and, and with outside, outside of the Muslim world. 
And I think that's due to a number of reasons. Number one is that people fail to realize that the majority of rulings that surround combative jihad came from the works of legal scholars and judges throughout history. The Quran and Sunnah laid down universals for combat, but those universals were dictated, understood, and defined over time. So what might have been fitting for a certain age is not necessarily fitting for this age. Number two is the actions of Muslims themselves, those Muslims who have taken upon themselves to act uh, uh, without any regard for human life, without respecting those principles laid down by the Quran and Sunnah and by Islam itself, and, and have actually done more to harm the religion and Muslims than to help them. Number three is the ignorance of the media and the ignorance of the people in general about Islam. Uh, I have a very good friend who works for CNN, and I asked her one time, Do, does the media like hate Muslims? Does the media have problems with Muslims? She said, no, they don't know Muslims. Muslims are not out there actively engaging them and teaching them about their religion. So I think those are three very important factors. And the fourth would be a long history of problems between the West and the East that really, really hasn't come to boil uh, since recently with the explosion of communications, the internet, and so on. Those four things have really led to a misunderstanding of jihad. Use of the word jihad has changed dramatically. During the 1980s, mainstream media labeled the Mujahideen, or jihadists, as freedom fighters. Less than two decades later, media outlets are distorting the meaning of jihad to describe terrorists. On the 24th of December, 1979, the first divisions of the Soviet armed forces crossed the Amudaba River, invading Afghanistan. This is a callous violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. It is a deliberate effort of a powerful atheistic government to subjugate an independent Islamic people. Jihad was now declared against the Soviet Union. In Kandahar, 4,500 Mujahideen waged war against 11,000 Soviet and Afghan army troops. Because of the abuse of the word jihad by the media and by politicians, the word jihad became very negative in the West. Actually, it scares people, it makes people panic to the extent that some young people who were arrested for having some engagement in violence were indicted and their indictments were that they are planning to do jihad. And this reflects a very poor understanding uh, of the word. In fact, not only the word jihad was misused, many words were used contrary to their meanings. For example, the word crusade. The word crusade means struggle against public evil, but because it was used to describe waves of destructors and bloody wars, now it has a very negative connotation. When people hear the word crusade, the only thing that jumps to their minds is greed, destruction, uh, occupation. That's why it is our role now to go out to, whole, to the whole world and explain the reality of the concept of jihad. The definition of terrorism has been contentious for many years. In September 2005, 150 world leaders met at the United Nations to define terrorism. But after two days, the summit ended without agreeing upon a definition. It is a different case in the academic community, where many scholars of political sciences and professors of international law have a clear definition of terrorism. Robert Pape, an American political science professor at Chicago University, has written two books on terrorism, Dying to Win and Bombing to Win. Terrorism, from my point of view, uh, is probably the ordinary uh, use of the word terrorism, which is the uh, killing of innocents for a political cause. Uh, by killing innocents, I mean civilians or off-duty policemen. Uh, by a political cause, uh, I mean getting uh, uh, the intention to get those people to change their political behavior. Uh, say, uh, surrender a piece of territory that they're holding on to, uh, or to otherwise change their form of government. Philippe Sands, a professor of international law at the University College of London and also the author of two important books, Lawless World and Torture Team. 
I think my general understanding of terrorism is that it is an act which is intended to instill fear in the population of civilians. That's the essential difference between a lawful act and an unlawful act. And lawful act in times of armed conflict basically says you can target military operations. What you can never do is target civilians. And once you start intentionally targeting civilians, you cross a line into illegality, into criminality, and in some cases, depending on the nature of the act, its extent, its purpose, uh, its design, you cross a line from ordinary criminality uh, into terrorism. But drawing those lines is never easy. So, if targeting non-combatants in order to force a political agenda is the clear definition of terrorism, then why is it that the United Nations summit failed to define it as such? Whenever I hear that um, there's a discrepancy with how the UN or another political body has defined terrorism versus how scholars tend to define terrorism, what I think immediately is that politics have come into the issue. That is, that states are essentially trying to defend what they believe are their own national interests and not wanting to uh, agree to a definition in which someone could claim, oh, you violated the norm. Uh, and so what I think is happening is that we shouldn't really be expecting a political body such as the UN to come together to have a clean definition of terrorism. Gunnar Westberg, a Swedish doctor and co-president of the Nobel Peace Prize winning International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Well, everybody knows what terrorism is, but they know different things. So they couldn't agree. Uh, some of the countries uh, wanted state repression against political groups as terrorists, to be called terrorists. Others did not want that. So because of this disagreement, they couldn't sign any document. They did not fail to define terrorism but rather they did not want to, for this would be an indictment on many of them. Governments have been trying to define terrorism for 50 years, and every time they get to a point where there will be disagreement, because one person's act, uh, which might be characterized in the eyes of some as an act to uh, stop oppression or colonialism or apartheid or discrimination, and which is an act in order to free that particular person will be seen by another person as a terrorist act. And of course, there is also the question uh, of whether or not acts of war and wanton violence, when large numbers of people are killed uh, by attacks in various parts of the world using very sophisticated military means, have consequences which are, in the eyes of some, analogous to terrorist acts. So states, I think, are never going to agree. What states can agree on if they can't agree on what terrorism is, is they can agree, and they have agreed, that there are certain things that no one can do in any circumstances. You can never target civilians. That is the golden central rule. Once you cross that line, once you break that rule, you expose yourself to the risk of criminal responsibility. Throughout the past two decades, there has been a growing trend of connecting Muslim people to terrorism. Increasingly, after an act of terrorism, the default reaction around the world has been to suspect Muslim people. There is a number of erroneous statements that are often made by people in the media in the West. One is to say that not all Muslims are terrorists, we agree, but all terrorists are Muslims. Uh, this is a very misleading statement and factually it is not correct. Uh, Muslims, even those who deviate from Islam, who committed acts of terror, were not the first to do it, nor the majority of people who got involved in this kind of operation. Not just Muslims are terrorists. Uh, there are Christian terrorists, there are secular terrorists, there are Jewish terrorists, there are Muslim terrorists, there are Hindu terrorists, and of course, there are many, many more of all of those people and all sorts of other people who are not terrorists. It's a very uh, simplistic approach, I suppose, that I'm taking, but it would be quite wrong to ascribe the category of terrorist to any particular group at any point ever. That would be quite wrong. Terrorism has been there for an enormously long time, and I think it will always be there. And I don't even see that Muslims are the main perpetrators, if we look at the world. Hindus are doing an enormous amount of, of uh, uh, terrorists, for instance. 
And uh, in Europe, we had all kinds of political groups who strongly influenced the politics of the country through their violent acts. Terrorism goes back since time immemorial, uh, as defined as I've defined it, or as even the 1997 convention uh, defines it. We have uh, examples uh, in Britain. I grew up as a child in London uh, when my mother wouldn't allow me to go shopping uh, in the centre of town because a group known as the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, uh, who happened to be Catholics, uh, were bombing the centre of London. That, that, those were terrorist acts. We know that in the 1940s in Palestine and what is now Israel, uh, Jewish groups used terrorist uh, methods uh, to instill fear uh, in a local population and against uh, the British. Terrorism is not a discriminatory concept. Um, t terrorism doesn't look at a person's uh, ethnicity, identity or nationality. Well, it's absurd to think that only Muslim people uh, can be terrorists. Uh, terrorism is not uh, gender, it is not nationality, it is surely not religion. Uh, there are Christians who commit terrorist acts, there are Hindus who commit terrorist acts, uh, there are Jews who commit terrorist acts. Uh, terrorism, again, it has, uh, its definition has nothing to do with those kinds of things. In 1994, Baruch Goldstein killed 29 Muslims and injured more than 150 others while they were prostrating in prayer at the Ibrahimi Mosque in Palestine. Goldstein was a New York-born Jewish Israeli and a member of the Jewish Defense League, a militant Jewish organization founded by Rabbi Meir Kahana. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh, a member of the Oklahoma-based Christian group Elohim City bombed an office complex in downtown Oklahoma, killing at least 168 Americans and injuring nearly 700. Elohim City established its church in the 1950s and was most frequented by members of the Christian identity, a group that believed that non-Caucasian people have no souls and can therefore never earn God's favor or be saved. In 2001, a group of Muslims that have come to be known as Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility for hijacking four planes and flying them into U.S. civilian and military targets. An estimated 3,000 people were killed, most of them in the World Trade Center in Manhattan, New York. What's the root cause of terrorism? I have thought long and hard about this, and uh, I think there are many examples one can think of uh, in which one has seen that the root cause of a terrorist act has a political objective, which perhaps many people will sympathize with. Uh, and it's always a very difficult issue separating out what the underlying rationale and purpose of the actors, and then how the struggle is carried out. The kind of terrorism that we're seeing today, I believe, is often a response to oppression. People are responding to feeling being oppressed, and one of the things people do when they get oppressed is they feel closed down. At some point, you get this explosion, this boiling over of anger, feelings of injustice, feeling of being uh, not part of the larger group, and they act out. And, and since they can't defeat it by itself, they oftentimes use terrorist acts. Uh, terrorism is a uh, form of violence, much like cancer, in that it comes in many, many different forms. And we know we have lung cancers, we have blood cancers, we have skin cancers, uh, and they're not all caused by the same things. Uh, and uh, they don't affect the same individuals the same way. So why would we think if 
all cancer doesn't have a single cause, why would we think terrorism has a single cause? Well, I don't. And so I studied the most virulent form of terrorism, suicide terrorism. Suicide terrorism kills more people than any other form of terrorism, uh, much like lung cancer kills more people than any other form of cancer. And suicide terrorism also has a specific risk factor associated with it, uh, much like lung cancer. In the case of lung cancer, it's smoking. In the case of suicide terrorism, it's foreign occupation. Foreign occupation, more than religion, more than poverty, more than any other cause, is the leading risk factor in producing suicide terrorism. While politicians have constantly promoted the notion that the root causes of terrorism are mainly ignorance and poverty, Dr. Robert Pape wrote in his book, Dying to Win, that over 95% of suicide bombings throughout the world had the same strategic objective, and that is to compel foreign armed forces to withdrawing from their country. The book is essential academic research on suicide bombings. Dr. Pape established that the probability of having a suicide bomber amongst any people increases 11 times over if their country falls under foreign occupation. Very often if you dig away at the root causes of uh, areas and parts of the world where violent conflict has erupted, where terrorist activity has taken place, and it goes back to time immemorial, one sees at the heart of this very often uh, issues not just of poverty, most likely, in my view, not of ignorance, but of a sense also of injustice at some wrong that has been done and that is continuing over time, that is not being addressed. In my opinion, it's injustice, humiliation, oppression that is, are the most common causes of terrorism. Some people claim that religion motivates terrorists. However, the academic research of Dr. Robert Pape has proved the claim to be false. Uh, what I did is I collected the first complete database of every suicide terrorist attack around the world since 1980. Uh, the first version of this database uh, uh, was uh, uh, published uh, a few years ago and it went from 1980 to 2003. Think of that as like the pre-Iraq database. And then the second version from 2004 uh, on, think of that as the data that's happened since Iraq. Um, and what the data shows quite clearly is that uh, the principal cause of suicide terrorism is foreign occupation. In that period from 1980 to 2003, there were 315 completed suicide terrorist attacks by 462 suicide terrorists who actually killed themselves. I don't mean attempts. These are people who actually killed themselves. The world leader during that 24-year period was not an Islamic group at all. They're the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. The Tamil Tigers are a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. In fact, over half of those 462 suicide attackers were purely secular. Because you see, many uh, Muslim suicide terrorist groups are also pure, purely secular, such as the PKK in Turkey. The PKK in Turkey, which did uh, numerous suicide attacks in the 1990s, uh, is again a Marxist, read, anti-religious suicide terrorist group. Because you see, if Islam, as uh, sort of a radical religion, or if it were just radical Muslims uh, doing this, then what you would expect is sort of this thin veneer of suicide attack kind of scattered all around the world. Uh, you would expect that, oh, there's 1.4 billion Muslims. You know, there's this teeny tiny fringe of Muslims kind of everywhere who'd be willing to do suicide attack. Uh, but that's not the way the data looks. It's really concentrated, and it's really concentrated in occupations. If the definition of terrorism is targeting innocent civilians to force a political agenda, then a closer look at history reveals the troubling fact that governments have been engaging in terrorism. One of the reasons that states have never been able to agree in the context of United Nations negotiations on the definition of terrorism is it's never been possible 
to find a form of words which excludes the possibility that states could in some way participate in terrorist act. In short, of course states can be engaged in terrorism. If a state places an explosive or uses military force in a random way, harming civilians as part of a political objective, it may well meet the definition of terrorism in that 1997 convention. Uh, terrorism has been practiced by both governments and militants. Uh, in fact, before I did my work on terrorism, I spent 15 years studying air power. Uh, I wrote a book called Bombing to Win, which looked at all the uses of air power by states from World War I through uh, the first Gulf War, over 40 cases, uh, major cases of air power uh, uh, in all. And in many of those cases, air power was used by states to bomb civilians in the hope that bombing those civilians would produce political outcomes. In fact, that's often called terror bombing <laughs> because it's a form of terrorism. As the Second World War continued to expand, the deliberate bombing of cities and civilian populations by both the Axis and the Allied powers increased significantly. This was known as strategic bombing and was used as a psychological weapon to break the enemy's will to fight, to decrease its industrial production and to push the civilian populations to revolt against their regimes. The strategic aerial bombardment in the European theater claimed the lives of over 60,000 British civilians and over 300,000 German civilians. Doubt about the effectiveness of bombing civilians in a conflict comes from the fact that despite the bombing of German cities, the country's industrial production increased throughout the war. When you bomb civilians, um, it tends uh, to uh, uh, almost always uh, congeal the support of the civilians against you. That is, the civilians come to hate you. They come to see you as uh, evil incarnate. Um, we may tell ourselves, or the British may tell themselves, they're, they're the good ones here and Hitler is the evil one. But uh, who's killing 300,000 German civilians here? <laughs> you see what I mean? Uh, so the uh, German civilians are very much hating the British, causing them to fight on and uh, make much greater sacrifices than they otherwise would, and in fact to support Hitler <laughs> in doing some of the nastiest things Hitler was doing at the time. Um, so that what's, what's happening here is that this is backfiring in just about every way imaginable. On Monday, the 6th of August, 1945, after six months of intense firebombing of 67 Japanese cities, a atomic bomb dubbed Little Boy was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, followed three days later by the detonation of a second bomb named the Fat Man over Nagasaki. As many as 140,000 Japanese civilians were killed as a result of the initial blast. And within weeks, the death toll increased to 250,000 as a result of radiation sickness. Within five years, the death toll exceeded half a million as resulting cancer and other long-term effects took hold. These are, to date, the only attacks with nuclear weapons in the history of humanity. During World War II, the Nazi regime committed a horrific genocide, killing civilians of non-Aryan ethnicities throughout Europe. Millions of Jews, Polish, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians, gypsies and trade unionists were prosecuted and killed. In 1948, 50 years after Theodor Herzl established the first Zionist Congress, the State of Israel came to being imposed on the land of Palestine. From this declaration onwards, using weapons recognized internationally as inhumane and illegal, the Israeli troops carried out systematic persecution, assassination and mass killing of Palestine, including children. of 
of thousands of innocent Arabs were killed and more than five million became homeless. Most of them became refugees in neighboring countries. This is called state terrorism. For me, terrorism is when innocent civilians are targeted, no matter who targeted them, whether killed by so-called militants or government military forces, it is a crime and an act of terrorism. Where's the case? Where's the case where bombing civilians with conventional bombs has actually won a war? We don't have very many. Maybe one, maybe two out of 40, 50 instances. That's not very much. And even those are probably uh, apocryphal, probably not true. When we look at these cases, as I said, 40 cases from World War I to 19, the 1991 Gulf War, many involving air power against civilians, we find no instances of that air power actually causing those civilians to abandon control of territory or to rise up and produce a popular revolt against their own government. In other words, it's not just that bombing civilians is immoral, it's ineffective. And that's a key message because many people believe that in war we should kind of put morality aside and we should do what works. Well, if bombing civilians doesn't work, then what is the case for bombing civilians? After the call to Islam became public, Prophet Muhammad and his followers endured 13 years of torture and persecution simply because they were inviting the idol-worshipping tribes in Arabia to worship God alone. The perseverance and passive resistance displayed by the Muslims showed a great level of self-control and inner strength. It was not only the weak companions and slaves who were subject to attacks at the hands of the Meccans. Also, companions of Prophet Muhammad from upper classes were not spared from one form of persecution or another, like Abu Bakr, who nearly died when he was beaten badly one day. It is worthy mentioning that the very first martyr in Islam was not a man at all, but a woman, Lady Sumayya, who was jabbed with a spear by Abu Jah, one of the leaders of Quraysh, which proves that even women were not spared from persecution and killing. To really appreciate the suffering and sacrifice of the early Muslims, one would just really need to look at some of the, the, the historical narrations about what happened in Mecca during those days. We talk about an embargo, we're not only talking about an economic embargo, we're talking about an embargo that it affected family relations, social relations, friends, relatives, affected the economic situation of the Muslims, affected their religious freedoms and political freedoms. It was an embargo that encompassed the entire community. And we look back at some of the reports, we find people saying that they ate grass. Some of the Muslims like Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, he actually ate grass to survive. He had no food. We read the reports about children who were crying and screaming who had no food. And Muslims would go to, to, to their brothers' markets, fellow non-Muslims, and be refused to be sold food, even though the food was right there in front of them. So this was not only an economic uh, embargo, but also a spiritual embargo, a social embargo, and most importantly, a mental embargo, which was designed to shake the Muslim community from their faith. To avoid getting captured by the Meccans, most Muslims had to immigrate secretly under the cover of the night, leaving behind all what they had of properties and memories. In Medina, 14 years after the beginning of the Prophet's mission, a revelation came from God permitting the Muslims to fight back. Permission was not given to them for more than 14 years. Despite all of the killing of victims and the suffering they endured, because their hearts were not yet ready to perform jihad. The Quran gave permission to the Muslims to engage in combat with their persecutors for the first time. The Quran says, permission to fight back is given to those who are being fought because they have been wronged. And indeed, God is all able to give them victory. This verse is clear in defining combative jihad. This combative jihad is in response to aggression and oppression and seeks to establish justice. 
which is the supreme goal, not only in Islamic teachings, but in every civilization, establishing justice is a supreme goal. If you lose your homeland, well, Islam is encouraging Muslims to fight back and regain their freedom. A lot of discussions and a lot of differences over why Muslims fight, uh, what justifies a Muslim to carry arms against others. Uh, as a convert to Islam, definitely um, that was a question that I had. And, and in recent years, due to the events that we've seen all over the world and the tragedies and, and, and the killing of the innocents, uh, I really had to do some soul searching. I was blessed to come and study in Al Azhar University uh, here in Egypt. And my fourth year of studies here, uh, we actually studied an entire course on jihad. And in that book, it clearly, clearly states that the reason why Muslims fight is not because they're fighting people who don't believe in Islam, but that Muslims can fight, even Muslims, if there is a situation where injustice is being perpetrated against them. So the main reason for fighting in Islam, according to that text, which was written by a number of scholars, as well as the majority of classical Muslim jurists, is to repel injustice. Muslim scholars throughout history explain the rulings of combative jihad depending on the two primary sources of Islamic legislation, the Quran and the Sunnah. The teachings of Prophet Muhammad mainly focused on two things. When it is allowed to go for combat, and if you go for combat, the do's and don'ts in combat. According to the Quran, especially in chapter 22, in verses 39 to 40, one ground for jihad is to protect places of worship, such as monasteries, synagogues, churches, and mosques. The Quran says, for had God not decreed to repel some people by means of others, demolition would certainly have come to many monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques, in which the name of God is much mentioned in praise. Another reason for jihad is failure to establish justice through peaceful means. Combative jihad is allowed only if the establishment or restoration of justice through peaceful means has failed. The Quran says, yet if they incline to peace, then you should also incline to it. This is one of the main rulings in Islam, that Muslims cannot perform combative jihad if their enemy wants peace. And of course, peace doesn't mean just ceasefire. Peace means ceasefire, we are returning back your rights. So that was crystal clear in the Quran and in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that Muslims should try to establish justice through all possible peaceful means. And if this happens, then Allah is opening no way for them to fight. The Quran says, Therefore, if they withdraw from you and fight not against you and offer you peace, then Allah accords you no lawful way to fight against them. Peace always comes as the first option in Islam. One of the chapters of the Quran is called Al-Fatih in Arabic, which means the manifest victory. And it starts like that. Surely we have granted you a manifest victory. And guess what? This victory was not in any battle. This victory was a peace treaty called Al-Hudaybiyah Peace Treaty. So what do you think about a book that calls a peace treaty a manifest victory? Is this book promoting peace or war? Amongst the Prophet's teachings was the direction not to crave conflict. He said, O oh people, do not look forward to meeting your enemies in battle and ask Allah to spare you from war. But if you meet them in battle, then stand firm. The right of a people to resist occupation by a foreign army is proving to be a powerful catalyst for many contrasting arguments in today's world. One main reason for combative jihad, specifically called qital, meaning fighting, is legitimate self-defense to stop aggression. Another reason for jihad is to resist occupation. One of the worst crimes that can occur to an oppressed people is the stealing and the taking of their land and property. Nearly in every ideology, the right of the oppressed people to stand up for their rights and fight the occupier 
is recognized. Islam encourages Muslims to resist occupation, which is in fact considered to be a form of enslavement. This is clearly unacceptable and humiliating for the occupied people. Resisting occupation is considered a duty and an essential human right in many cultures. Emiliano Zapata, a leading figure in the Mexican Revolution said, it is better to die on your feet than live on your knees. One of the, the groups of Mujahideen were the founding fathers of the United States of America, who stood up against oppression, who resisted tyranny, but no one charged them with terrorism. The same can also be said about the French, who were great Mujahideen in the face of Hitler and the Nazis. Among the founding fathers of the United States of America, and one of the most prominent figures in the American Revolution, is Patrick Henry. He said, give me liberty or give me death. No one can blame the founding fathers of the United States of America in fighting and resisting for the sake of freedom. Also, no one can blame the French for resisting and fighting the Nazis. It's common sense. I think people have the right to resist occupation in a violent way under some circumstances. Uh, I think those circumstances held in the case of the American Revolution um, and uh, created the, uh, what became the United States. Um, I think that uh, the circumstances are where the uh, foreign government, the foreign occupier, are uh, abusing the population uh, and where there's a fairly broad consensus among um, the, uh, uh, the local population and the leaders of the local population that that is in fact occurring. The United States was founded on uh, uh, a revolution. Uh, it was a right of the people to uh, uh, overthrow an abusive government. Um, this was something that was uh, enshrined in our Declaration of Independence. Uh, uh, this is what the Declaration is all, is all about. In occupied territories, it is plain there are going to be a community of individuals who are going to resist the occupation. Uh, whether you talk about occupation during the Second World War or occupation in more recent times, there are going to be circumstances in which a great number of people are going to consider that some form of resistance is lawful and legitimate and justified. The question is, what are the limits in law on what you can do. And it comes back again to these very simple principles that I keep saying. It may well be permissible to target through force, through violence, military objectives, but what you can't ever do is expose civilian populations to the threat or to the use of force. Once you do that, even in a situation of occupation or unlawful domination, you are crossing a line, just as a state crosses a line when it ever uses violent weaponry against civilian targets. To serve their hidden agenda, some people wrongly present verses of the Quran in order to deceive those who don't have sufficient knowledge of Islam. Take for example, uh, some people say, how come Muslims are having in their book, fight in the cause of Allah? They should have love in the cause of Allah like other religions. But again, the same immoral cut and paste game is played against Muslims. The verse actually says, fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight against you. But they don't continue the verse and they take the words out of context playing this game always against us. The Quran says, and fight in the cause of God those who fight against you, but begin not hostilities. Indeed, God does not love those who commit aggression.
a major problem within the Muslim community as well as outside of it is what I call drive-through jurists or cut-and-paste jurists. Those people, whether they're Muslims or not, who take, splice up verses, edit them, you know, add a little TiVo, or maybe even give it a little, you know, a, 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 a cut and paste job here and there, and present verses and statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him, either which are not complete or out of context, using those verses, and using those statements of the Prophet to justify egregious actions. Some people say, how come Muslims are having in their book, kill them wherever you find them? As if the Qur'an is only encouraging Muslims to kill non-Muslims. As if Muslims should walk with two machine guns to kill non-Muslims wherever they find them. But they are playing the same immoral cut and paste game. If you read the verse as a whole, it says, kill them wherever you find them and drive them out from where they drove you out. This verse is telling Muslims to fight their occupiers and regain back the freedom of their homeland. One of the clearest proofs that combative jihad is only to establish justice is that it is allowed for Muslims to launch jihad against Muslims too, if they are the transgressing party. And this is not my own opinion, this is the very words of the Quran. It's very clear in the Quran that if Muslims are oppressors, they can be fought against. So it doesn't matter who's Muslim and who's not, but what matters is who's an oppressor and who's oppressed. And if two groups of the believers fight amongst themselves, then reconcile between them both. But if one of them rebels against the other, then fight you all against the one that which rebels until it complies with the command of Allah. And if it complies, then make reconciliation between them justly. A powerful verse which illustrates the profound sense of justice in Islam. And it clearly expresses that Muslims are not ordered to fight people of other faiths simply because they share a different faith than Muslims. But it illustrates that Muslims are ordered to fight against oppression wherever it comes from and evil. What's interesting historically when, when you look at the early Muslim conquests as people like to call them, I mean, even in prayer, when we start our prayer, that's called a conquest. So Muslims are not looking at the conquest in the sense of only a military victory. But when they entered those countries, people greeted them and welcomed them. They did not rise up against them. In fact, some of them even sent letters to the Muslim leader saying, come invade the country, we'll help you uh, and help us to relieve this yoke of oppression from our necks. So it's very rare to find that there was a wide resistance against the occupying armies of the Muslims. During the 7th and the 8th century, when Muslims fought against the Roman Byzantines and the Persians, they were rarely faced by any civil resistance. In fact, many civilians joined the Muslim armies and fought against the Romans and the Persians themselves. John, the Bishop of Nikiyu, an Egyptian Coptic historian, was an eyewitness to the Muslim army's conquest of Egypt. He wrote in his chronicles that the Egyptian Aryans joined the Muslims in besieging the Roman soldiers in the Babylon fortress. The emerging Muslim community under the leadership of Prophet Muhammad was surrounded by two of the greatest civilizations known in the history of mankind the Roman Byzantines and the Persians. Despite histories of achievement in the service of humanity, civilian populations were ravaged by war and suffered mass genocide at their hands. Innocent civilians were raped and killed. Cities were looted, plundered, and put ablaze in wars at that time at the hands of the Romans and the Persians, like in Salamis, Carthage, Rhodes, and Sardis, and in many other places. Islam did not allow combat except after putting regulations on it. There is a code of combat in Islam. Prophet Muhammad taught his followers to observe a strict code of war. He strongly emphasized the protection of civilians and their property, as well as aiding them through the difficult times after conflict. 
When we talk about the Prophet's teaching and in, in, in its relationship to jihad, there are two important points that we need to make. One we've already made, when it is allowable for a Muslim to fight, and that was clarified earlier. But secondly, this is not like some type of WWF anarchist approach towards fighting. The Prophet, peace be upon him, as well as the Qur'an, uh, uh, laid out very specific examples and rules for the one who's engaged in combat. Because combat is one of the most hated words in Islam. In fact, people would come to the Prophet and say that they named their son war, and the Prophet would say, change your son's name. Combat is not something that's liked by people. So it definitely has to come with rules because the ability for people to oppress and harm others is great in combat. So number one, the Prophet forbid us very clearly not to kill people from other faiths, religious leaders of other faiths. Number one, to harm the older, elderly people, to harm those people who are unarmed, to harm children, to harm any innocent civilian is clearly forbidden in Islam. In fact, some of the prophetic narrations about uh, killing the innocent and warning against doing so have reached the status of what's called tawatur, which means so many people narrated those statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that there's no room for doubt, there's no room for questioning them, and the Muslim is bound to act on them or he goes outside of what's called war and becomes known as what's known as a terrorist. The controversy over what to count as legitimate act of war or a good act of jihad versus what must be considered a vicious act of terrorism has created an atmosphere of confusion which some have used to their advantage. There seemed to be a great mix-up between martyrdom in a sense of self-sacrifice, something which is regarded as a noble act by all armies all over the world, people who sacrifice their life and are, uh, you know, praised as heroes or freedom fighters on one hand, even if that requires self-sacrifice, and between acts of terror with people who are misled to believe that this is martyrdom. In other words, there are acts that are Islamically acceptable as true martyrdom that are called terrorist activities. And there are also acts that are basically terroristic acts and violate the teachings of Islam that some people call it jihad or martyrdom. That confusion must be removed. The rules of international law on methods and means of warfare, it's known as international humanitarian law. It places very strict limits. You distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. Combatants are a legitimate target, non-combatants are not a legitimate target. And those rules are now codified in a set of instruments that were negotiated and concluded in 1949, the Geneva Conventions. And there are four Geneva Conventions supplemented by two protocols in 1977. And the rules in Geneva to a very large extent reflect what's called custom international law. That's to say they are binding on everyone, on all states, on all actors, on non-governmental entities uh, as well. Among the teachings of Islam is that no one can be fought except a combatant. And this is one of the main rulings of the code of combat in Islam, which is stated clearly in various verses of the Qur'an and the statements made by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Qur'an says, And fight in the cause of God those who fight against you, but begin not hostilities. Indeed, God does not love those who commit aggression. By saying, fight those who fight you, the verse is clearly putting a limitation on fighting to be directed only against combatants who took arms against Muslims and started hostilities. Violating the Islamic ethical code of combat, such as targeting non-combatants or fighting an unjust war, disqualifies it as jihad. Killing civilians on 9-11 cannot be justified in Islam. What happened on 7-7 cannot be justified in Islam. Bombing civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki can also not be justified in Islam. Innocent civilians are innocent civilians. We don't have something called collateral damage in Islam. Collateral damage could show up 
on the day of judgment and speak against you, a child, an innocent woman, an innocent man, or an old person. So we have to really clarify this point for people and, and, and have to actively address Muslims who carry those ideas too, that the killing of innocents, the killing of innocent civilians is an issue of violating a treaty, which is a form of hypocrisy and lying, which are from some of the major sins uh, in Islam. So by killing an innocent person, not only are you bringing upon yourself the major sin of murder, you're bringing on yourself the major sin of hypocrisy as well as forgery and lying. Even though the Islamic rulings are clear as to the prohibition of targeting non-combatants, some Muslim fanatics who fail to comprehend the rulings of jihad have been involved in terrorism. Less than two decades after the death of Prophet Muhammad, fanaticism appeared amongst a group of Muslims known as the Khawarij, or Karajites. Shortly after the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a group called the Khawarij surfaced, and their primary function was destruction, killing, and chaos, disregarding the Quranic injunction that ordered people to respect the sanctity of the soul. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, foretold the appearance of fanaticism amongst some Muslims. He spoke about their characteristics. Prophet Muhammad explained that the problem was not that their intentions were corrupt, but rather it was their understanding of the religion that was not sound. He said, each of you would consider his own prayers and fasting insignificant compared to their prayers and fasting. They would recite the Quran, but it would not go any deeper than their throats. They would leave the religion just as the arrow exits from the other side of the prey. Sins in Islam are of two types, major sins and minor sins. Killing is among the major sins. It's a major sin to kill in Islam to the extent that killing one innocent soul is equal to the killing of all mankind. The Quran says, whoever kills a person except in punishment for the killing of another person or for the spreading of dire corruption in the earth, it shall be reckoned as though he has killed all humankind. And whoever saves a life, it shall be reckoned as though he has saved the life of all humankind. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, alluded to the graveness of the crime of murder when he said, a faithful believer remains at liberty regarding his religion unless he kills somebody unlawfully. Because of the Prophet Muhammad's teachings that murder is a major sin and a vicious and evil crime, violent ideologies like that of al Khawarij never found a good medium to propagate in the Muslim world, except in the past few decades. This is a phenomenon worthy of studying. The ideology of the Khawarij reemerged during the past few decades. Similarly, the contemporary extremists incorrectly interpret Quranic texts to justifying the killing of civilians. The birth of the Khawarij uh, really provides an archetype for Muslims to constantly compare uh, those groups who claim or take a stake in authenticity. And, and when we look at the Khawarij, we see uh, a few common traits. Number one is hyperliteralism. There is no concept of analogy, no concern for context of text. The verse is what it is. The, the, the meanings of the words are as they are, and there's no deep uh, investigation into the reasons and objectives behind religious text. Number two is a, a fetish for standing up against religious scholarship, discrediting the role of scholars, the guidance of scholars. Number three is looking at society in general, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, in a very, very negative way, in apocalyptic fashion. And interesting enough, 
Many of these traits are shared amongst groups like Qaeda, as well as some of the more fringe neoconservative groups in North America, who, for example, have called for the death of our President Obama. Uh, some of them are supplicating in churches, asking for his demise. These type of traits, Muslims look at them and are reminded of that devastating historical, historical epic that uh, we encounter when we dealt with the Khawarij. Fadl Soliman, a Muslim who has dedicated his life to educating non-Muslims on Islam and to de-radicalizing Muslim youth who may have fallen under the influence of self-appointed leaders challenge their ideology. We have our own law, the law of God, who says in his book, وَإِنْ آقَبْتُمْ فَآقِبُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا أُقِبْتُمْ بِهِ And if you punish, let your punishment be proportionate to the wrong that has been done to you. In fact, they debated with me, saying, According to this verse in the Quran, we are allowed to kill their innocents and their civilians, as they killed our innocents and our civilians in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Kashmir. So I said, but they did not only kill our civilians, they also raped our women in Bosnia. If you think that the verse is actually allowing you to respond to them in the same way you were harmed, why don't you go and rape their women? They said, no, we don't do that. I said, why not? Don't you think that the verse is allowing you to do this? They said, no, rape is an illegal sexual act. I said, therefore, the verse is not general. This verse is equal to the one in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which also exists in the Quran, which means that simply if someone blew up one eye for you, you cannot blow up both his eyes. If someone damaged one tooth for you, you cannot go and damage all his 32 teeth one eye and one tooth do not transgress your limits. But still, you cannot rape women, even if your enemy did. You cannot kill non-combatant civilians, even if your enemy did, or you would be exactly like them. The Old Testament says, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. The Quran says, Now, in it we prescribe for them a life for a life, and an eye for an eye, and a nose for a nose, and an ear for an ear, and a tooth for a tooth, and retribution for wounds. Yet whoever would forego this out of charity, then it will be taken as an atonement for the one who has suffered injury. few years, incidents involving the abuse, torture, and dehumanizing of prisoners of war, exposed by leaked pictures and eyewitness accounts, have caused outrage around the world. Some guilty officers and wardens were trialed and sentenced to jail, whilst the real criminals have not been brought to justice. And common Article 3 basically says that when you have a detainee, irrespective of who they are, irrespective of whether they're a prisoner of war, a combatant or non-combatant, you have to treat them with humanity. You cannot uh, impose outrages against their dignity. You cannot abuse them. You cannot be cruel to them. You cannot torture them. And that is a bottom line rule that applies at all times and in all circumstances and reflects general international law. And that is well established in what you've called the code of uh, combatants uh, in international law. It's often not respected but it provides a benchmark uh, against which one decides whether or not an act or a form of treatment is legitimate and lawful or not. The central thing I think to focus on if we want to limit these kind of violations is not tighter and tighter rules by international lawyers to uh, circumscribe states. We've got to cut directly to the reason why states are doing it. They're doing it because they believe they'll get an advantage. Do they actually get an advantage? I'm thinking of studying torture. I don't believe torture provides much of any real advantage. So what's the case for torture? Many practices that are contrary to human rights are being increasingly justified as means to obtain important intelligence and to fight the war on terror in general. Unsurprisingly, this has resulted in much international and domestic debate over the effectiveness of these methods. The Islamic perspective on this matter, however, 
is crystal clear. Muslims are not allowed to torture or dehumanize prisoners of war, irrespective of how they are designated. It is rule number two in the Islamic Code of Combat. Prisoners of war are not to be killed or tortured. This rule is solidly established and it was clearly observed during numerous incidents during the Prophet's time. After the Muslims were forced to immigrate from Mecca to Medina, an armed conflict began between the Muslims and the tribe of Quraysh, which lasted more than eight years. Known as the Battle of Bitr, this was the first in a field of battles that took place between the Muslims and their enemies. In the year 624 AD, a small, poorly prepared army of 317 Muslims met a heavily supplied army of 1,000 Meccan idolaters. The night before the battle took place, an intelligent unit of three companions of the Prophet arrested two men who were bringing water from the army of Quraysh. The Prophet's wisdom shown in his chosen method to extract information from them. It is a clear display of the high standard of morality to be implemented when dealing with prisoners of war. During one of the battles, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, criticized his companions for beating two prisoners of war in an attempt to obtain some information. This was an immoral act, and in torturing the prisoners, the information was also unreliable. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had a different approach to the situation. He simply asked the two prisoners, how many camels do you slaughter every day? They said, some days nine camels, some days ten camels. He looked at his companions and he said, then the army is between 900 and 1,000, as one camel feeds 100 men. The Prophet's technique in obtaining information during war was far removed from any violence or dehumanization of prisoners of war. Muslims are not allowed to torture prisoners of war physically or even psychologically. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, blamed one of his companions for walking some prisoners of war along a path where they saw their dead before the burial. He said, O Bilal, don't you have mercy in your heart? In fact, Islamic teachings go even further in encouraging good treatment for prisoners of war. The Quran describes it as an expression of love for God. The Quran says, and out of love for Allah, they feed the poor, the orphan, and the prisoner of war. In 630 AD, the Prophet Muhammad led an army of 10,000 Muslims. Till that day, it was the biggest army ever to march in Arabia. They marched towards Mecca, which was to surrender to him peacefully, without a single blow of conflict. For more than 20 years, the people of Mecca caused nothing but hardship for the Prophet. They persecuted him and his followers while they were in Mecca. And uh, they waged wars against them after their migration to Medina. People usually accept you know, peace treaties when they're unable to sway a, a battle in their favor. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he comes into Mecca, he comes in now as the dominator, as the guy in charge, if he wants to be. But how does he come in? With humility, with tranquility, with forgiveness, with an open heart. It's almost unbelievable to see someone that, that, that could act in this fashion towards people who killed his uncle, who persecuted him, who, who, who embargoed him, who treated him with such, such, such its evil uh, actions that he comes back and says what? To these prisoners of war, he says, whoever wants to be safe, let them go to the house of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was the greatest enemy of the Prophet. So this is a historical moment which Muslims have to reflect on from that time to the end of time on how Muslims should treat their adversaries in war. The Meccans gathered and the Prophet mercifully asked them, What do you think I will do with you? With fear in their hearts and tears in their eyes, they said, You are a noble brother and a noble nephew. 
Prophet Muhammad announced a universal pardon. He said, no reproach upon you this day. May Allah forgive you. And their lives were spared and their homes and properties remained in their possession. 500 years later, Salah al-Din, a Muslim leader, would follow in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad in dealing with prisoners of war after defeating his enemies in one of the bloodiest battles of all time. Some people claim that the goal behind jihad is something far more sinister than fighting against oppression. Islam is an anti-Christ religion that intends through violence to conquer the world. Jihad was for 1,300 years a holy war led by the caliphate, the world Islamic state. Islam is a one-party totalitarian system. It's a one-party state that will not allow you to speak and it will kill anybody who challenges or questions. Islam is not a religion. Islam is a very dangerous political ideology. Uh, to our society, and it's time we wake up, this is not just a nice religion, it is a political movement went, bent on world domination through the sword. That's what jihad is. We have a problem in all over the world with the ideology of hatred, which is called Islam. Jihad is not holy war, and that's a, a common uh, confusion that's found in a lot of dictionaries and even some translations of Quran, that the word jihad is translated as holy war. Actually, war is not holy, life is holy. And the reason that war is legislated in Islam is to protect life in the first place. All of that goes back to protecting the sanctity of life. And within war itself, there are so many rules and regulations that the Muslim has to follow, which are designed to protect the innocent from harm or even abuse. Unfortunately, some people claim that combative jihad is a holy war against non-Muslims or a war to spread Islam all over the world. And to prove their point, they go as far as using some verses from the Quran, manipulating them and taking them out of context, taking advantage of the lack of knowledge of their audience about the Quran. The expression holy war was introduced to the world in the literature of the Crusaders about 900 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad. Pope Urban II was the first pope to spread the idea of holy war or a crusade to the European public as a term for the recapture of holy land from the Muslims. He urged his bishops to preach to their communities, taking advantage of the Europeans' passion for religion. The symbol chosen for the crusades consisted of five crosses, symbolizing the five wounds that they believed Jesus Christ received during the Passion. The Pope and his legislators promised forgiveness and eternal happiness to the impoverished and famine-stricken Christian peasants if they would die in the Crusades for Christ. The Pope's famous words were, God himself will lead you, for you will be doing his work, Deus vault, which means God wills it. The response to his speech was far greater than even he expected. History was firmly marked when hundreds of thousands marched towards the east, predominantly from France, Germany, and Italy. European historians never had any consensus on the exact number of crusaders in the First Crusade. But Muslim historians claim that there were over one million men from different European countries. Some crusaders were motivated by their Christian piety and the will to liberate the city of God, while others were driven by greed and the will to establish new faith strongholds in the wealthy East. What no one can deny is the looting, plundering, abuse and pillaging that took place at every opportunity. The undisciplined rabble marched eastwards, massacring Jews in the rainland and even attacking and pillaging the Christian villagers of Hungary and Bulgaria. After the fall of Jerusalem in the hands of the crusaders of the First Crusade, all 70,000 Muslim civilians of Jerusalem were killed and slaughtered. Men, women and children, 
historians mention that their blood flowed like rivers in the streets of Jerusalem. Historically, Saladin or Salahuddin, the Muslim commander who defeated the Crusaders, did not kill any civilians after his victorious entry into Jerusalem. His magnanimity stands out, in contrast to what the Crusaders did nearly 90 years earlier, killing nearly 70,000 civilians. Therefore, we see that to never target non-combatants and never torture prisoners of war are two main rules of combat in Islam. However, the Islamic code of combat is far more extensive than these two rules. The code of combat in Islam is comprehensive and covers many social, economic, as well as military aspects related to wartime. Among its instructions is that Muslims must not destroy infrastructures. Another of the important instructions from Prophet Muhammad was, do not poison the wells. Amongst the teachings of the Quran is the protection of houses of worship. The Quran says, For had God not decreed to repel some people by means of others, demolition would certainly have come to many monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques, in which the name of God is much mentioned in praise. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Don't destroy crops, don't kill animals, don't even disturb birds in their nests. He did not allow the mutilation of bodies, whether dead or alive. Also among his instructions was to bury all dead. Even if the enemy fled the battlefield, leaving their dead behind them, it is the obligation of the Muslim army to bury their dead bodies like they buried their own dead. If Muslims are ordered to fight in order to repel oppression, if by fighting they themselves became the oppressors that they sent out to fight, that will be the greatest act of hypocrisy ever seen. So for that reason, in Islamic law, especially with regards to fighting, we find that the order not to oppress runs the gamut. Muslims are ordered not to poison wells, to destroy natural resources, to harm animals, to harm places of worship. In Egypt, where I lived for six years, I, I, I would walk around Cairo and still see churches that existed before the time that Islam came to Cairo left in, in, in actually immaculate condition. Muslims were ordered not to harm anything because if you're setting out to repel oppression, the worst thing that you can do is become the oppressor that you set out to fight. All these teachings bring us back to the spiritual jihad as it is extremely dangerous if a person seeks to defeat his enemy before defeating his own ego. The result would be exchanging one tyrant for another. Reading the Islamic history, one has to be amazed at the level of discipline of Muslim warriors toward their defeated enemies or their citizens of the conquered countries. A few years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, an army of only 8,500 Muslims defeated the Romans and took over Egypt. They were under the leadership of Amr ibn Alas, one of the Prophet's companions, highly commended as a military genius. John, the Bishop of Nikiu, a city in northern Egypt, was a contemporary of the Romans' defeat at the hands of the Muslims. He wrote a chronicle which is considered by the Egyptian Christians to be the most trusted source of the history of the Coptic Church. Bishop John of Nikiu described the return of the Orthodox Pope with these words, and Amba Benjamin, the patriarch of the Egyptians, returned to the city of Alexandria in the 13th year of his flight from the Romans, where he went to the churches and inspected every one of them. He also described the way Muslims ruled Egypt in another passage. And Amr became stronger every day in all fields of his activity, and he collected the taxes which had been agreed upon, but he took none of the property of the churches committed no acts of desecration or plunder, and he preserved them throughout all of his days. In today's world, defeating terrorism has become the dream of people all over the globe, regardless of their race, gender, nationality, or faith. However, a single universal approach to defeating terrorism could never be sufficient. 
This is due to the fact that terrorism has many different forms and people from different cultures and backgrounds, as well as states and governments have been guilty of it. Analysts and researchers have proposed a spectrum of approaches to tackle the problem effectively. Terrorism will never be eliminated unless we deal with the root causes. If we keep on treating the symptom instead of the disease, then we should not expect any progress. Therefore, the disease has to be diagnosed first in each case, and the root cause of every form of terrorism has to be identified in order to combat it. What it takes to solve the issue is greater public understanding of the true causes of suicide terrorism. Uh, right after 9-11, uh, we had a very unusual circumstance. We had a new threat, suicide terrorism. We had almost no knowledge in the academic community, not just in the public, but in the academic community. And suddenly, people had to have an explanation. Well, they came to an explanation, which is they were Muslims who did 9-11, therefore it must be Islam that's causing suicide terrorism. Turns out that's just simply wrong. It's a false assumption, and it's terribly important to educate uh, publics and leaders about the true causes of suicide terrorism. Does that mean that then publics and leaders should simply give in to terrorist demands, give them whatever they want? No, that doesn't mean that at all, and I'm not claiming that they should. What I am saying, however, is that a better understanding of the true causes of suicide terrorism will encourage governments to come up with alternative strategies in their own interests to achieve their aims in better ways. The key point is that many, many terrorists are not mindless, irrational individuals. They may engage in acts which we deplore. They may use violence against individuals which we deplore and for which they should be criminally punished. But they are motivated by, in some senses, some of them, some of the time, a form of rationality which points to some serious political grievance. Uh, the number one thing to do is to take the circumstance away that is producing suicide attack, which is um, uh, ending the use of ground forces uh, threatening territory that terrorists prize. Uh, or another way to put it is ending foreign occupations of Muslim countries. If acts of injustice and occupation are the major provoking factors behind suicide terrorism, then why do so many governments fail to take the appropriate action in dealing with these causes? One of the reasons why governments have been failing in their efforts to combat terrorism is the fact that they did not gather significant knowledge into its patterns and causes. Before the attacks of September the 11th, there wasn't a single database of global patterns of suicide bombings. Robert Pape started to create the first database of this nature, which was not published until 2003. After 9-11, uh, there was a tremendous amount of fear, a tremendous amount of hatred, tremendous amount of anger, and that emotional uh, energy uh, uh, was going to be uh, uh, very important uh, in leading governments to take actions. But if you marry that deep set of emotions with an absence of knowledge, that's the worst of both worlds. That's the worst situation. So what we can do more than anything else to combat this is actually public education. Many vicious acts are committed under the banner of jihad, as well as many crimes are committed in the name of war on terror. But neither can the first be considered as jihad, nor the second can be considered as war on terror. Crossing the red lines will turn both of them into acts of terrorism. Classically, Muslims who lived under non-Muslim societies religiously were bound to observe the laws of those societies as long as they did not contradict any major, major pillar of faith. And secondly, they were forbidden to engage in acts of violence against non-Muslim societies. And that covered two scenarios. Number one is the citizen of that society, and number two is a visitor to that country on a visa. So you have a great classical legal jurist, Imam Ibn Qudama, who in his book al Mugni says very clearly that a Muslim who enters a land of the non-Muslims, or a Muslim who lives in the land of the non-Muslims, is bound 
by a treaty of peace and security as long as his rights aren't violated. And the overwhelming majority of Muslims who reside in non-Muslim lands have that understanding and articulate that understanding. From an Islamic perspective, ends do not justify means. By that we mean that there are two important conditions to consider any self-sacrifice of that nature acceptable Islamically. One is the purpose, secondly are the means used to achieve that purpose. As we said earlier, the purpose of repelling aggression, resisting oppression and restoring peace, even if it requires self-sacrifice, is are acts of heroism like all armies in all countries consider them to be. So the objective must be just, it should not be unjust war. But that is not enough. And I repeat again, ends or good ends do not justify any means, which means that the means of achieving that must be legitimate. And as mentioned earlier, uh, civilians or non-combatants should not be hurt. You're, so you're only fighting against the aggressors, people in, the, in uniform who are killing, pillaging, and destroying. You cannot violate any of the ethical code of combative jihad in Islam as has been described earlier. So you need these two conditions, and that's where the confusion arises, that some people are driven by the perceived sense of injustice done to them or their brethren, that they forget that you don't have to have only a just cause, but you have to follow the ethical means also. So, one would naturally ask, how can these misconceptions of Islamic ethics of war be challenged and corrected? The root cause of terrorism has been linked to a number of issues, economics, uh, politics, uh, social issues. My experience firsthand in dealing with people who have been infected by that virus is that this is a, a, a disease which is rooted in thoughts. And the way that you combat thoughts is with more powerful thoughts and ideas. And my experience with, with a few uh, youngsters who were initially influenced by that, that, that strand of thought was to sit down with them, talk with them, walk them through the potential outcomes of those choices that they were making in light of what the Prophet has taught us, in light of what Islam has taught us, and Alhamdulillah, all praise be to, a God, to God Almighty, I can attest that all of them changed their minds and changed their ideas. The people who are affected the most are the innocents. They are also the weakest. You see, one of the problems we have with states using terrorism is that states are the strong actors, and they're using the terrorism or the violence against not just innocents, but weak innocents. It's they're the weaker side that are being uh, typically harmed or bombed in this case. The Quran says, and what is the matter with you that you fight not in the cause of God and for the weak, ill-treated, and oppressed among men, women, and children. What did we say the weak are suffering from? Terrorism. Therefore, according to this verse, the word jihad does not equal terrorism, but rather war on terrorism. Jihad means war on terrorism, the real one. Combating terrorism committed by any entity, whether individual, organization, or a state, is a form of jihad. After giving jihad and Islam strong consideration and, and taking the time to invest in understanding a religion like Islam, and, and that's something that Muslims and Christians, as well as Jews, Hindus, people of all faiths, atheists, have to take the time to invest and cultivate an understanding of each other. After doing that, I would hope that someone will be able to look at jihad and Islam and see it as a means of removing oppression, uh, as a means of removing uh, the plight of the poor, those who are exploited by others, and come to a conclusion ultimately that we are going to shape this world according to how we believe our ideas and act on those ideas. So it's a challenge, especially in recent years, for us to move beyond these stereotypes, to work to assist each other live together in an equal fashion and respectable fashion and pray to God dearly that he'll bless us to, to live in the footsteps of the prophets and the great leaders and righteous people who preceded us. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., 
Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. Surely Muslims were not, are not, and cannot be angels for 14 centuries. Like all faith communities, they had their own shortcomings, which is one aspect of being a human. Meantime, it has been the testimony of many that Muslims as a faith community fared quite well historically and comparatively speaking and contributed immensely to human civilizations. They did not stop at tolerance, but they were even more accepting. And acceptance is a concept that is deeply rooted in the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These true, undistorted teachings are precisely what humanity need today. Let us join hands in pursuing what we all need and aspire to. Peace, justice, equality, and an all-embracing sense of human brotherhood. If we want an earth restored without war and without the threat of war, we need to understand that we are all humanely equal. One innocent victim in London or New York is the same as one innocent victim in Gaza and Kabul. The 21st century has led humanity to a new phase in its existence. It is a time when we are able to communicate throughout the planet. We are able to share information. We are able to cross barriers of race, ethnicity, and politics. And so in a sense, we are one human family. So if there is injustice in one part of the planet, there is injustice all over the planet. If peace is established in one part of the world, then peace can be understood and felt throughout this planet. Let us work together as a human family. This is a great opportunity for humanity, or it could be a terrible time of calamity. Since terrorism is a result of injustice and oppression, if people come together in a unified effort to end them, then we will definitely see the end of terrorism.